We study billionaires, and this is episode 113 of The Investor's Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by RealVisionTV.com. Real Vision is the number one video on demand channel for finance where the world's greatest investors provide full length interviews and behind the scenes access. This is a service that Stig and I both use every single day because of the enormous value and insights we gain from listening to billion dollar portfolio managers. If you want to test out Real Vision TV for one week free or get a 10% discount on your subscription, Use our coupon code TIP, which stands for The Investor's Podcast, today. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, hey, hey. How's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Seoul, South Korea. And today we have renowned author, Dr. Jim Rickards with us. And if you're not familiar with Jim, he's a graduate of Johns Hopkins University. He's also a graduate of UPenn, New York University Law School. Jim's worked on Wall Street for more than 35 years, and he's probably seen some of the craziest things that have ever happened on Wall Street. And just to give you an example, he was a principal negotiator for long-term capital management during the bailout with the New York Federal Reserve Bank. So get ready to hear some amazing insights on the whole host of topics today. In addition to all that, he's a two-time New York Times bestselling author for the books Currency Wars and The Death of Money. Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. And congrats on the new book, which we want the audience to know about. And the title of the new book is The Road to Ruin, and that hits stores on the 15th of November. So we're honored to receive an advanced copy of that and to have you on the show. Oh, thank you, Preston. It's great to be with you. So Jim, last time you were here, we were talking all about gold. Today, we've got some similar conversations, a little bit to do with gold, but more uh, that the conversation is changing a little bit and you're adding more to this narrative of what we've been talking about for the last year and the stuff that we were talking about on the last show. And that's all in your new book. So in an effort to give people a snapshot of what the new book is about, give them a quick overview and tell them what inspired you to write this new volume. Sure. The new book is called The Road to Ruin, and it's actually volume three of a projected quartet. So Currency Wars was volume one. The Death of Money, Volume 2, The Road to Ruin, Volume 3, and there'll be a volume for a couple of years from now. So uh, where The Road to Ruin fits in and what's a little bit different about it, the currency wars and the death of money in different ways warned about the instability of the system, how we haven't really fixed anything or recovered really since the 2008 panic, and warned about a coming collapse in the system. Volume three, or the, the Road to Ruin, the current book that, that we're talking about, really puts you in the crisis. So instead of warning you about the crisis, it says, okay, the crisis is here. How will it play out? How will it be different from 2008? And then kind of work backwards to what can you do today to prepare for it and preserve your wealth in the crisis? And to illustrate this, I take three crises, 1998, 2008, and then I say 2018. And that's not a hard and fast prediction, you know, January 1st, 2018, everything is going to fall apart. I don't mean it that way. It's really just taking that 10-year stretch from 1998 to 2008, going out another 10 years to 2018. That's a reasonable estimate of when we may have another panic. But the point I make is it could happen tomorrow. Don't get complacent and think, well, gee, uh, I've got two years to deal with this. Uh, you may not. You may not have two days. But as I say, it's just a, it's a, it's a device to maintain this 10-year tempo. So I go through the history of each one of these crises and my projections for the next one. Of course, 1998, we all know what happened. Uh, although, uh, candidly, it's a little distant to certainly some younger market participants today. They may have heard of long-term capital management, but it's 18 years ago at this point and a little bit old news, but I, I go through that. The bottom line there was that Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. And by the way, we were hours away from closing every market in the world. We were hours away from a complete financial collapse uh, worldwide. That's not an exaggeration. You know, Alan Greenspan and Robert Rubin uh, all testified to that effect. And uh, I, I was there. I, as you mentioned, I was the uh, chief lawyer for long-term capital management. I negotiated that bailout. 
I was in the room with Fed officials, Treasury officials, all the leading bankers, you know, a thundering herd of lawyers from all the top New York Wall Street law firms. And we got it done. But it was a close run thing, as Wellington said about Waterloo. It could have turned out differently. It, it could have not happened. And if that had been the case, it would have been a very, very a calamitous turn of events. 2008, the same thing. We were days away from the sequential collapse of every major bank in the world. Bear Stearns had failed in March 2008. Then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac failed in June and July 2008. Then Lehman Brothers in September 2008. They were falling like dominoes. It was very clear that, you know, Morgan Stanley was going to be next, probably a couple of days away, then Goldman Sachs, then Bank of America, then Citibank, then J.P. Morgan. They were just falling like dominoes. Of course, what happened is the Federal Reserve truncated that process. They intervened. Uh, it's just like dropping a steel wall in a row of falling dominoes. You know, one domino is going to hit the wall and the next one's still going to be standing. But the way they did that was with tens of trillions of dollars of swaps. And I'm not talking about the money printing on the Fed's balance sheet. We've seen that. They printed $4 trillion or almost $4 trillion over the following eight years. And that's a, that's a big intervention manipulation in and of itself. But not known at the time, we found out later, was they did these massive, uh, it was a like $10 trillion of swaps with the European Central Bank. And what was going on there was the European banks had dollar loans and they were funding them with dollar liabilities. Those liabilities were mostly short-term bank CDs and IOUs that were held by U.S. money market funds. Now, there was a panic in the U.S. Investors were taking their money out of the money market funds. Those money market funds could no longer roll over those liabilities of the European banks. So the European banks had a, a funding crisis, a liquidity crisis. They turned to their own central bank, the European Central Bank, as the lender of last resort. But the problem was the European Central Bank can't print dollars. They can only print euros. And these banks needed dollars. So what they did is the European Central Bank printed up trillions of euros. The Federal Reserve printed up trillions of dollars and they swapped the dollars for the euros. So the Federal Reserve actually got 10 trillion euros or thereabouts. The European Central Bank got the 10 trillion dollars, used that money to bail out their own banking system. In addition, in this country, the Fed and the FDIC guaranteed every bank deposit in America Regardless of size, there was an insurance, there was an FDIC insurance fund that would guarantee up to $250,000. But let's say, you know, you're an auto dealer, you're a successful entrepreneur, and you've got a million dollars in the bank as your working capital, et cetera. They guaranteed the whole thing, regardless of size. They also guaranteed every money market fund in America, not legally required. They did that to stop this run on the money market funds, which I described earlier. So massive, massive intervention. So you have this sequence. In 1998, Wall Street bails out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bail out Wall Street. In 2018, who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, each bailout gets bigger than the one before. Each crisis gets bigger than the one before. And then you have to keep looking, you know, well, who's got a bigger balance sheet? Who's, who's left, in other words, to conduct these bailouts? And the answer points directly to the International Monetary Fund. They have a printing press. They can print world money. I mean, it is world money. They call it special drawing rights or SDRs, a geeky name, but that's a, no one will understand what it is. It's world money. That's, that's all it is. And they, they can print that in unlimited quantities. Their balance sheet is fairly clean. They're leveraged about three to one. By the way, the Federal Reserve today is leveraged about 113 to one. I mean, it looks like the worst hedge fund you've ever seen. So the next bell is going to come from the IMF. It's going to come in the form of this world money, the SDR. But that will completely and irrevocably change the international monetary system. From then forward, the SDR will be the benchmark global reserve currency. We'll still have dollars. They'll still be around and they'll still be held in reserves, but they will no longer be the world standard. You won't see oil priced in dollars. It'll be priced in SDRs. It'll be transformative and highly inflationary. So all of this is baked in the pie. You can see it coming. It's not that difficult. I take readers through it in the book. It's also very well documented, well supported. I, I don't like to make claims without backing it up. So in a, in a 300 page book, you've got 151 end notes and 30 pages of sources, but there's plenty there for readers to sink their teeth into. So Jim, in your book, you talk a lot about some of these engagements that you have with some of these Fed officials from time to mm -hmm. time. And I know that you're floating this idea with the SDRs past them as being the next step and the thing that's really going to kind of bail out the bailouts, the bailouts. Are they the ones kind of supplying you with that notion that this is the direction this is going? Or are you 
basically shooting that idea past them and then kind of seeing how they react? It's a great question, Preston. And the answer is it's a little bit of both, depending on the official you speak to. And it, it's funny, these individuals, they're not homogeneous. So let me, just for the, the listener's benefit, let me kind of paint the picture a little bit. Uh, just in the course of my consulting and a lot of my clients are government directorates or different affiliations I have, different invitations I receive, whatever, you know, a lot of different venues, but I have had the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, you know, Ben Bernanke, of course, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, members of the Board of Governors, regional reserve bank presidents, senior treasury officials. I mean, sometimes I'm invited in to consult with them and that's how I meet them. Other times you run into them, you know, you might be at the same dinner table at some small event, you know, a lot, a lot of different venues. Regardless of the sources, I have had a lot of encounters. Now they fall into two categories. There are certain U.S. officials who kind of, I would say, don't get it. The kind of thing we're talking about, the International Monetary Fund, the rise of SDRs, the instability in the system, that they just don't get it. By the way, none of these people are, are dumb. I mean, they're all smart. I mean, they wouldn't be in the positions they're in if they weren't talented and smart. But you can be very talented, very smart. But if you're trained a certain way, if you're using certain models, if you have not acquainted yourself with the latest kind of, I would say, scientific advances in understanding the statistical properties of risk, and you're just going to think about the world a certain way. It's like thinking the world is flat instead of round. A lot of people did that for a long time. There are a lot of examples. But for example, I was in a, it was a war game type of thing. It was a closed door session. There were about 20 of us seated around a table, and there were Fed officials, Treasury officials, CIA, military think tank people. And we were doing, you know, doing a war game, financial war game type of scenario. And I said something not different than I just said on this podcast, Preston, about SDRs and world money. And this person sitting to, to my right, a senior treasury official, and he kind of harumphed and said, what are you talking about? He almost didn't know what SDRs were. I mean, he knew, but he didn't really think that it was a very topical subject. And he said, the dollar has been the global reserve currency. It is today and it will be forever. The worst to that effect. <laughs> And I said, you know, I feel like I'm sitting in Whitehall in 1913 listening to John Bull talk about how sterling is the global reserve currency and always will be. And of course, it was just one year later that the demise of sterling began and it was complete not long after that. So that kind of inability to see dynamic change, to see the dynamic processes underway, you do encounter. I've had discussions with uh, senior monetary officials, uh, you know, research type people at the monetary economics uh, branch of the Fed or monetary research. And I'll introduce or start talking about some of the complexity models and other models that I use. And they literally can't process it. It's not, it's not even that they disagree. Like they're not, okay, I'm going to have an argument or I'm going to disagree with you. I welcome that. I mean, I'm always up for a debate. They don't even do that. They just can't process what you're saying. Having said that, there are other people who are very plugged into this world. And I'm thinking of people like uh, Zhu Min, uh, who just recently left as deputy managing director of the IMF. So the, you know, second or third highest official there, depending on how you want to count, but former deputy governor of the People's Bank of China. So imagine that. Here's a PhD economist. He was deputy governor of the People's Bank of China and deputy managing director of the IMF. So really a foot in both camps, the kind of communist Chinese camp. And someone like that, their understanding is much more subtle, much more sophisticated. They understand what we're talking about here perfectly. They see it coming. And that's a source. But beyond that, we can a little deeper dive on this. A lot of this stuff is just on the website. I like to say the IMF is transparently non-transparent. These are, you, know, you can call them forecasts, but they're not really forecasts. The, I like to say the future is here today. The future is embedded in the present. You just have to know where to look for it and understand the process. You know, I know you're really big onto the complexity theory idea of how the economy works. And I forget what book it was we were reading. Maybe it's the alchemy of finance. Or we, Stig, you and I were talking about a speech that George Soros had given. And the thing that we find really amazing about the way Soros sees the economy, and I know a lot of people don't like him for his politics and a bunch of other things, but from an economic standpoint, the guy's brilliant. And one of the things that is really interesting about his approach is that he says the entire system is unstable. That's his fundamental thesis, is that the whole thing's unstable. And in college, they teach you the exact, literally the exact opposite of that way of thinking. They tell you that the system's always stable and that it goes together. And so whenever I see some of your writing in, in your book where you talk about complexity theory and that, and you're talking about some of these you know, central bankers that do see the world through that lens, 
I find it really interesting to see this this rivalry that I think is occurring right now in economics where some people don't see it that way and then you got the traditional way of thinking that everything's stable. Yeah, because I think everyone out there, they're probably thinking right now is that they're talking about two different worlds. Could you try to quantify that? And on one hand, we have the equilibrium models and what we call the stability models. And that is what we teach in colleges all over the world. And then on the other hand, you also have, there are not that many, but you have people like Jim that are talking about complexity. So Jim, perhaps you would be the best person to explain the difference between the equilibrium models that that might be broken, and then another theory or the complexity theory that you advocate for in your book. Uh, the complex dynamics, complex phenomena have been around for 14 billion years. The, the Big Bang was a complex phenomenon. So, you know, the creation of stars and planets and, and gases and supernova and things that people have witnessed since the beginning of time or the beginning of civilization are all complex phenomena. So there's nothing new about complexity. But it is new as a science. When I say science, meaning you can define it, you can describe it, you can write equations, you can do experiments, you can test it. That's that's what makes something scientific because, as I say, you can you can test hypotheses and get useful information from it and then use that for forecasting. So uh, complexity as a science really goes back to about 1960. Now, Soros talks about reflexivity, but it's it's kind of the same thing. What he means is that he's really talking about feedback loops or what a mathematician would call recursive function. So it's a function where the output is the input. So I write the equation, I plug in some variables, make some assumptions, and I solve the equation and I get a, an output. And then I take that and plug it back into the same equation and run it again, and I get a different output and so on. So you do it iteratively for everything about computers, you can do it a million times and you can plot the output you know, on a graph and actually look at the graph and draw conclusions about the dynamic system itself. Is it, there's a kind of, you know, collapse on itself. That's called a fixed point attractor where, you know, you get a certain answer and then you run it again. It's the same answer and run it again. It's the same answer to infinity. That's called a fixed point attractor where, where everything converges on a single point. Or you get other variations of that where the answer is different. You run it against different, run it against different. And there's no pattern. It's chaotic. And then there, there are patterns in between recurring patterns. It's, just, it's fascinating to watch. But but that's what Soros means by reflexivity. What he's saying is that when you pursue a policy or pursue an action, you cannot just understand it in a linear way. You cannot just take it and extrapolate and assume more of the same, more of the same. That What will happen is that the output of the action becomes the input in the next version, and then it collapses in on itself and produces totally unexpected results. And that, that is a good understanding, whether Soros you know, has a working knowledge of the mathematics, it, it kind of doesn't matter. I think he's on the right track in terms of the surprise element in the system. Now, where, and, and I agree with that, where I part ways with Soros is, uh, I lean the other way. I would say, look, the less government, less regulation we have, we can actually disaggregate and break up these systems and make them less dangerous. So it's not that we're ever going to be able to control human behavior, but we can make the outcome of human behavior less dangerous to financial stability by doing some smart things like breaking up banks and reducing derivatives and and so forth. So these are policy solutions we're kind of still running through the theory at this point. But I do talk quite about this in the book. And, and look, if you want to be a scientist, bring it on. Let's describe the science, write the equations, uh, test it, do models, and look at output and look at actual empirical data and see what works. And when you do that, what you discover is that equilibrium models are a really poor description of how market works and complexity models fit extremely well. You don't have to torture the bell curve to get a fat tail. A power law distribution actually has a fat tail. It's a feature, not a bug, as the saying goes. So you're right. We were, you know, I actually had a lot of difficulty with undergraduate economics. I went to graduate school in economics, and then I've studied quite a bit on my own ever since. And I've had occasion to, you know, I shared an office with Myron Scholes for six years. Myron was the winner of the Nobel Prize in economics in 1997, and along with Robert C. Merton, who was another partner of mine, long-term capital management. So uh, I've had ample exposure to the brightest minds in economics. But when I was studying economics as an undergraduate, I had a really hard time. And I thought that I just wasn't that smart, like I didn't get it. I found out decades later that it didn't make any sense, that the reason I didn't get it was because it was nonsense. So I, I feel better about that because I was, I was failing to comprehend nonsensical theories. But one of them is equilibrium theory. And the, what they teach you is that the market produces a natural equilibrium. So, you know, prices get too high, consumption goes down, and then 
inventories build up and the producers stop producing as much and then prices get lower and then people buy more and the whole thing. And it was itself equilibrating. Whenever anything gets a little bit out of whack, it causes a kind of linear uh, reaction, which brings it back into equilibrium. And then when you apply that to policy, you say, okay, the economy hums along in a nice equilibrium, but yeah, every now and then inflation gets a little too high or unemployment gets uh, a little too high or maybe it's too low and that drives the inflation. All you have to do is, it's like a top that starts to wobble. And if you just straighten it out a little bit, it'll be back on a nice equilibrium. And the role of policy is just to give it that little push to put it back into equilibrium. In fact, that's not how the world works at all. That's the worst possible model you can have. The economy resembles an equilibrium system most of the time without being an equilibrium system. It is a complex dynamic system capable of producing extreme unexpected results almost out of nowhere, what scientists call emergent properties. And so this is why policymakers are surprised over and over again. They did not see the 1998 crisis coming. They did not see the 2007 mortgage crisis coming. They did not see the 2008 panic coming, the global liquidity crisis in 2008. For the last eight years, the IMF and the Federal Reserve, each one of them gives a one-year forward forecast. The IMF actually does it twice a year. Fed does it once a year. They have been wrong by orders of magnitude. I don't mean a little bit wrong, like you say, oh, I think it's going to be 3.2% growth. Then it comes out at 3.1. I would say, nice going, guys. That's a really good forecast. No, they say 3.2 and it's you know 2.1. Then they lower it to 2.5 and it's 1.8. You know, then they say 2.2 and it's 1. I mean, it's ridiculous. They're not even close. Well, if you have the wrong model, you're going to get the wrong output every time. It's no surprise. You can go back to the minutes of the FOMC meetings in. Uh, the spring of 2007, uh, I think specifically March 2007, and Ben Bernanke is on the record saying, you know, this mortgage stress will blow over. And it was, we'll, we'll be fine. Or there's never been a time when housing prices declined in the entire United States at the same time. Like, those housing price declines are, are regional or local. Maybe they went down in Texas in 1984 because uh, the banks were having problems down there, but they went up nationally. But they've never gone down nationally ever. Well, that's exactly what happened in 2007, 2008. So, they never see it coming. It's not a surprise. They've got their own models. What is interesting is when you get the right models, as I say, there's a lot of data to support this, you get very good results. And that's not perfect. There's always some uncertainty around it. And you need to have a good dose of humility when you do this kind of forecasting. But once you see the system for what it is, your capacity to forecast goes way up. Amazing. Uh, amazing discussion. And I would actually, Jim, like to transition into talking specifically about your book. And because one of the interesting things in your book is that it starts off with a conversation between you and a high-ranking representative from BlackRock. And surprisingly, you learned that the regulators pressured BlackRock to not sell securities during an upcoming crisis. And this is an event I just want to put that out there that happened very recently. So that might sound like a good thing to many people since one could argue that it would stabilize the economy not to sell securities during a crisis. But could you elaborate on why this seemingly reasonable initiative to protect the financial markets might turn out to be disastrous if put into effect? Sure. The conversation uh, you're referring to, Stig, involves something called SIFI, S-I-F-I, and that stands for Systemically Important Financial Institution. So then there's a G-SIFI, which is a globally systemic important financial institution, and then they have variations on that where it, financial institutions specifically refers to banks, but they've swept in other kinds of companies, including at the time General Electric, which uh, General Electric Credit Corporation, they were in leasing credit cards, consumer finance, et cetera. Interestingly, in, in the years since I started writing the book, The Road to Ruin, the regulation of General Electric got so onerous that they actually sold all those divisions. General Electric today is kind of out from under what we're talking about right now because they've returned to uh, their roots as an industrial equipment and electronic technological corporation. They're very happy making uh, jet engines and wind turbines and uh, electric locomotives and a lot of other things. But they took one look at what life was like under the thumb of the Federal Reserve and they basically sold off all their financial assets. So they're kind of out of that trap. But a lot of others are not, including uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance, uh, Prudential Insurance, and of course, the one um, you mentioned, Stig, which is BlackRock. Now, again, for the listener's benefit, BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. The, most people have heard of them, but if you haven't, I mean, their, their assets are in the tens of trillions of dollars. 
They are bigger than most sovereign wealth funds, you know, bigger than any of their competitors. And the question was, the question that came up at this dinner that I describe in the book with uh, one of their senior officials, and, and not, a lot of times in these things, I don't mention the person by name. I mean, there's no point in that. The conversation is what counts. We were talking about the government's efforts to include BlackRock in this category, in the SIFI category, so they could, in effect, regulate them. And you know, I'd been in the papers, and I said something to the effect of, well, you know, it's, it's kind of a pain, but they really just want your information, and they want to know your positions, and that's a little more compliance work for you, but it's, not, it's nothing you can't live with. You guys have the resources to do it. And she kind of leaned forward and said, no, that's not it. They want to tell us we can't sell securities. They want to actually stop us from doing that if there's another financial panic. And that hit me right between the eyes. That was a shock. But the reason for it becomes very clear. Now, BlackRock was pushing back against all this, against the government's efforts to do this. And their argument was, hey, we're not a bank. We don't have liabilities. A run on the bank, you know, a bank is a, a leveraged institution. It has assets in the form of, you know, securities and investments and loans and, and so forth. And then has liabilities, mostly in the form of deposits. And there could be bonds and notes and other things on the liability side. But a run on the bank is when all the depositors want their money back and they line up at the bank and the bank can't sell the assets fast enough to get the money. They owe the, the money short term, but the assets are long term. and they start dumping them and that sends security prices down and that causes a market panic. And this is kind of a typical bank run and the, the phenomenon is pretty well known and there's some precautions against that. But BlackRock's saying, we don't have those liabilities. We're an asset manager. We take assets under management from clients. We charge a fee. We manage them, but those assets belong to the clients and there are no liabilities. We're not funding this with debt and deposits. They're just, they're just things that people own and we manage them for them. So why on earth who would be included in this. That was the argument. Well, it makes pretty good sense on its, on its face. You're not going to have a run on BlackRock. There's nothing to run. They don't have the liabilities. But what this conversation revealed is that that was not the government's agenda. The government wanted to basically freeze BlackRock, tell them that they couldn't sell in a panic. Now, who are the clients of BlackRock? Well, it's China Investment Corporation. It's uh, CalPERS, the California Employees Public uh, Employee Retirement System. These are some of the biggest accounts in the world. So when you control BlackRock, you indirectly control China. If you tell BlackRock they can't sell client assets, you're effectively locking down China. The United States has no jurisdiction to tell China what they can do with their money. But if you put BlackRock in the middle and assert some regulatory control over them, then you can. And this is part of a much larger effort. And I have a whole chapter in, the, in my new book, The Road to Ruin, on this called ICE-9. And for those not familiar, uh, Ice Nine is a, an idea I, uh, lifted from Kurt Vonnegut, famous author, novelist of the uh, 20th century. And the plot device of Ice Nine in the book was uh, there was sort of a brilliant physicist who invented this doomsday machine. And he called it Ice Nine. It was a polymorph or molecular variation of the H2O molecule for water, but it had two differences from water. One is that it had a, a melting point of 114 degrees Fahrenheit, which meant that it was frozen at room temperature. And the other characteristic was if a molecule of ice nine came in contact with a molecule of water, the water turned to ice nine. And so you had it in a vial, you had it in a couple of vials. And the plot was, you know, if you open the vial and poured the ice nine into any stream, then that stream and the river and the oceans and the lakes and every, all the water in the world would freeze and the planet would freeze and life on earth would die. That was the doomsday machine. And I bring that into the financial sector uh, as a way of describing how the elites will freeze the monetary system, freeze the financial system in the next panic, because it'll start somewhere. Let's say it starts in the money market funds and you lock down the money market funds. The money market funds suspend redemptions. They say, we won't give you your money back. Well, then everyone will just go to the bank and take the money out of the banks. So then you're going to have to close the banks and reprogram the ATM so you can only get maybe $300 a day for gas and groceries. Well, if you close the money market funds and close the banks, everyone will sell stocks. So you have to close the stock exchange, et cetera. In the same way that ice nine molecules spread, you know, exponentially, geometrically from molecule to molecule until all the water in the world is frozen. By the same token, you're going to go institution to institution, market to market and lock down the entire system so nobody can get their money back. So I call it ice nine as a, a shorthand for this plan to basically close all the markets and freeze everything. They'll say it's temporary. We'll see how soon they reopen it, but it will basically be to buy time in a panic until the IMF can convene a meeting, get their act together, and reliquify the world with these SDRs. 
I think it's really interesting discussion, Jim, here, because I know a lot of people out there, they're probably thinking, this seems too much out there. Are really going to freeze the system? But I also know there will be a lot of Europeans listening and saying, well, look at what happened in Cyprus in 2012 and in Greece just a year ago. Could you tell us, Jim, what actually happened in those two countries? And is it really true that we might see this on a much grander scale and how does those situations compare? That's a great question, Stig. And it kind of goes back to the point I made earlier. You know, I in the last segment, I was talking about, you know, closing the banks, closing the money market funds, closing the exchanges, freezing the system. And I can just picture a, a listener rolling their eyes and go, boy, this guy's really out there. You know, this sounds like extreme and that would never happen. It can't happen here. And I said earlier that I never make any claims without providing the backup. And the point is, uh, every single thing I described, the legal authority is there. Many of these legal authorities have recently been changed to specifically to allow what I'm describing. And everything I'm talking about has happened before elsewhere in the world and in the United States. So there's, there's nothing unprecedented, nothing for which the elites are not prepared along the lines I just described. Now, let me give you specifics on that. Until very recently, really just in the past couple of months, money market funds were not allowed to suspend redemptions. By the way, money market funds is one of the great misnomers of all time. People go, I have my money in a money market fund. Like, no, you don't. It's not money. If it's in a money market fund, you're a unit in a particular form of mutual fund. And people go, oh, yeah, but I can call up my broker and sell my units and they'll wire the money to the bank. That money will be in the bank that, you know, tomorrow. So I can pay my kids the tuition or you know, buy a house or whatever I need that money for. Well, what if the money market fund suspends redemptions? What if the bank is closed, et cetera? It's not, you may not be able to get it. But, but the point being, in 2008, there was a run on the money market funds. Everybody was pulling their money out, moving it to the banks, doing exactly what I just described. Whatever they can sell the assets for, that's what you get, number one. But more importantly, and this is what's going to happen, they have the ability to suspend redemptions, which means they don't have to give you your money back. They can issue an announcement saying, sorry, house closed. We've pulled up the drawbridge, closed the gates, and you cannot get your money back until further notice. This is very new. And it was done specifically to prevent a repeat of 2008 because they don't want to guarantee all these money market funds again. They don't want to watch the system be bled dry. They're just going to freeze those accounts. And people don't realize this. I mean, they might have you know, you get your monthly brokerage account statement from Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab or whatever. And, you know, they get a paper statement. They put these little flyers in there. I usually take them and throw them in the trash. I'm sure a lot of other people do likewise. But if you read them, what they say in the fine print is that we can do this. Now, this has always been true with hedge funds. I've read hundreds of hedge fund offering documents. I've never seen one that didn't have the ability to suspend redemptions. But investors know that. I mean, you know, sophisticated investors know that. They know what they're getting into. But this is brand new in money market funds, and it is the law today. There are other legal authorities that you know, go all the way back to the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 that allows the U.S. to freeze assets. Something called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977 gives the president dictatorial powers to basically do anything, close banks, close stock exchanges. In 1933, President Roosevelt, by executive order, closed every bank. Just close them. Imagine that by executive order on his first day in office, said all the banks are closed. He did not say when they would reopen. It turns out it was about eight days later, but nobody knew that at the time. Nobody knew when those banks were going to reopen. In 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months from uh, July to December 1914. And you're right, what we saw in Cyprus and Greece. In Greece in 2015, people were flying from Athens to Frankfurt with empty luggage, filling it up with euros flying back to Athens so they could spend some euros. The ATMs were closed. The banks were closed. The debit cards didn't work. The credit cards didn't work. People were resorting to barter. As I say, leaving the country, coming back with notes. So don't tell me this can't happen. It has happened. And just to wrap up this bit, Stig, but again, to make the point, in November 2014, Brisbane, Australia, G20 meeting, leader summit. So who's there? Angela Merkel, uh, President Xi of China, President Obama of the United States. They issued a final communique, and in that communique were working papers, one of which is the bail-in plan. This is the ICE-9 plan. And they lay it out. They said, you know, we're not going to use taxpayer money to bail out the banks anymore. We're going to use the depositors' money, the stockholders' money, the bondholders' money. You still have a hole in the balance sheet. You still have to seize somebody's money. But it's not going to be the taxpayers. It's going to be people with investments, stocks, bonds, and deposits. That's what I mean by ICE-9. Yeah, that's what I think a lot of these people that are potentially buying some of these really scary banks over in Europe, call it Deutsche Bank or whatever, 
that own the debt, own those bonds. I don't know if they aren't aware of what bail-ins are, but that would be my biggest concern with some of these banks. Right. I can't imagine buying some of this debt on some of these banks over there. The other thing I wanted to highlight, Jim, that I think really goes well with this. So we listen to a lot of things that Ray Dalio says. And one of the things that we love that he talks about is the focus that the typical investor has, the span of what they're referencing, their reference point or their baseline is usually like a couple years, a decade at most of what they think is in the realm of possible because of what they've actually seen in their lifetime or what they've participated in. And when you take and you widen that scope and you open up that aperture to within a lifespan, or you even go a lifespan and a half, how much more could potentially happen in the future, which you could potentially be aware of, it just goes exponential. So you're talking a lot about things that happened in the United States back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And for most people, A, they have no idea what some of those events are. And B, they have this frame of reference. Oh, that could never happen. That was 100 years ago. That, that could never happen in my lifetime. And that's where I think people really don't place enough respect for what the realm of possibilities might actually occur. And I mean, like you said, 2015, Greece. People couldn't even go to an ATM and, and pull money out. This was last year. Right. It's, this is last a, year. It's a developed economy. It's a member of the euro. We're not talking about Zimbabwe here. And um, you're absolutely right, Preston. I mean, I'll give you a, a, like a personal anecdote along those lines. But, you know, I was at long-term capital management from start to finish. I was there in early 94 before the fund had its money before the fund closed. And then uh, I was there through the panic in 1998 and stayed a year after that to kind of clean up the mess and start the wind down. And I remember talking to one of the partners after the crisis. So we were, we all stayed in place. I mean, the, the bailout was September 28th, 1998, but I stayed around to August 99. But that, that year, uh, late 98, early 99, we were unwinding the positions. We had new ownership at Wall Street had taken over. The 14 families, as I call them, had taken over the balance sheet. But I was talking to one of the, the quants, you know, and my job, I was the lawyer, you know, so I, again, I negotiated the bailout and negotiated a lot of the contract. And I was around, I knew everything that was going on, but I wasn't, at the time, I wasn't highly trained in risk management. I, I have been, I spent the 16 years or 18 years since then doing uh, exactly that. So I'm a lot more uh, conversant with it today. But I said to one of these guys, I said, you know, how could this go so wrong? You know, we had all these models, you had all these computers, you had all these covariance matrix and regressions and present value calculations. And I know how much time and effort everyone put into it. How could it go so wrong? And the guy shook his head. He goes, I don't know. I don't know. So we had these, we took these relationships, you know, all the way back to 1985, 1985. But what he meant was 1985 was approximately the invention of the swaps markets. So those were the early days in swaps. So if you had the entire price history of the swaps market and you, it would have gone back to about 1985. But I thought, well, there are always substitutes. I mean, you can look at the spread between government bonds and railroad bonds, right? That's a, in, in 1885. In 1885, the railroads were the best industrial credits out there, and their bonds were gilt edged, and there would have been a spread to treasuries, and that would have been some indication of what, what credit risk looked like. And I thought to myself, you know, but this is a complete lack of imagination. By the way, this guy had like a 160 IQ, you know, MIT train. He knew the numbers, but he didn't know history. Uh, he didn't have, the ability to do exactly what you described, Preston, and that, that Ray Dalio said, which is, you know, widen the aperture, get a longer perspective. Okay, so the swap market doesn't go back to beyond 1985. But now credit goes back to like 5000 BC. I mean, uh, there's a famous book, A History of Interest Rates, that, that goes back to Mesopotamia in like 2000 BC. So you can work this up. And by the way, one of the, the often the nicest compliments I get on, on my books, uh, hopefully The Road to Rome, but also, you know, Currency Wars and the Death of Money from younger readers who like the historical parts because uh, they just haven't been taught it or they, they haven't had time to acquaint themselves with it. And maybe they, they got a good modern education in economics or some applied mathematics, but for some reason they, they never got the history. And when you take them through the economic history and just make the point that all of these things have happened before and there's no reason to think they won't happen again, the idea that somehow we're twice as smart as you know people 50 years ago, we're not. I mean, we're about the same. You know, we, we know a little more, maybe some scientific advances have been made, but we're not smarter than people a hundred years ago. We have the same cognitive biases. We have the same prejudices. We're, li we're prone to the same mistakes. No reason these things won't happen again. 
Hey, Jim, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this first part of the episode. For everybody listening, next week we have the second part of our interview with Jim. But before we hang up here and, and finish this first part of the show, I want to give Jim a chance to give a handoff to his websites, his books, and just kind of tell people where they can learn more information about you, Jim. Thank you, Preston. I really appreciate that. Uh, my new book is The Road to Ruin. It's available on Amazon, also at Barnes & Noble. And at independent bookstores, I have a website, www.jamesrickardsproject.com, Twitter handle at James G. Rickards. And I put out a pretty steady stream of comment about the international monetary system. So uh, look forward to uh, welcoming all the listeners to those uh, venues. At this point in time on the show, we would like to say a special thank you to a person in the GIP community, Christoph Wolf. Christoph is now on his third year of posting on our forum and the quality of the posts are always top quality. As a small token of gratitude, Christoph, we would like to give you access to our chapter-by-chapter -chapter video course of the Intelligent Investor, and also our new course, How to Invest in ETFs. I do want to stress that this is nothing compared to what you have done for the TAP community, and we still hope we can continue to repay you for all your hard work. And for anyone that would like to check out our courses, we have also free investing courses in there as well. You can check out TIP Academy, which you can find on the navigation bar on our website. That was all that we had for this week's episode. Stay tuned for the second part of the interview with Jim Ricketts next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application.